The first lecture we talked about on the large scale, like say from the mind of God to the creation of the physical universe, what that was talking about. This is going to be the, the, the makeup of the internal aspects of each individual. And that's what this Gnostic cabal or the microcosmic tree of life is going to be talking about. So we have a quote here. All the laws of nature exist inside us, and if we don't find them inside ourselves, we will never find them outside. This is by uh, Samael. This is, this is basically showing this, uh, this maxim, as above, so below. I don't know if you've heard that one. It's kind of an ancient esoteric one. So the idea is that um, th this ancient maxim illustrates that the same system of creation and organization used to create the physical universe is also found within the interior of each individual. These kind of pictures are always sort of trying to that's depict them. Cool yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's an old one. Oh, yeah. yeah. Ooh, <laughs> I think it's from one of Eliphas Levi's books. Who? Uh, Eliphas Levi. He was uh, from the 1800s, oh, I, I think. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, man is a small universe. This is along the same lines of this as above, so below maxim. The principles of the tree of life are found not only in the external aspects of the universe, but in the internal workings of man also. Man is a microcosmic reflection of the macrocosm. As we have seen, the universe was created first through will, then intellect, then emotion, then instinct, and finally action. And so too is man organized. Remember, we've seen that in the original Tree of Life, how it came down in those triads. Um, but with man, or I'm talking about mankind in general. I don't mean to offend anybody by saying the word man. Mm -hmm. By humankind. Instinct precedes action, emotion precedes instincts, intellect precedes emotion, the will precedes the intellect. This is kind of just a brief summary of that first, uh, the first lecture we did. <coughs> so now this is the Nasa Kabbalah. Um, and you can see we have it, uh, you can see the individual there and the Sephiroth placed around the individual. Um, the ten Sephiroth represent different aspects of the internal makeup of every person. So each one of the Sephiroth it relates to a, a, a body or a principle that we carry within us. We climb the ladder by eliminating ego and freeing essence. This is also referred to as Jacob's ladder, if you remember. The Jacob's mm -hmm. ladder in scripture is this tree of life. Oh, you know, oh, and us being, being down here. The two pillars are, are significant too, particularly in a the, the lot of systems use them. They use them in Freemasonry extensively, these two pillars. But they have uh, the positive and negative ideas. You know. They're also the two pillars at Solomon's Temple, is why they're used in Freemasonry. Their names in particular. Um, so as we transmute our energies through alchemical practices, we begin to create higher bodies. And you guys have been exposed to this already. This should be a bit of a review. Like building the solar astral body and the solar mental body. And then from there you can build higher bodies. Which I think we, we would have talked about in the seven bodies as we've talked about already. But if you want to stop and talk about anything, we can. I don't feel like we have to stick to the plan. We can make this our own thing. So... Uh, the bodies that we create are merely vessels that can contain our higher spiritual aspects. The idea is that these higher spiritual aspects, that we can call them soul or the in in inner being, they're, they're, they exist on a higher vibratory rate than what this body can contain. So when we raise these energies and we create these vessels, I create a, a higher body, and then that principle, that spiritual principle, can incarnate into that. So it's kind of like creating a, a, a vessel that will hold that light of the right frequency. And that's why you have to go up in stages, because if this highest body that we possess, which we'll get into, were to come into this body without creating these ones, it would just shatter this body. There is no way it could even come into it because it's totally different vibratory rates. Um, as we create these bodies, our higher spiritual aspects begin to fill or incarnate into them. So that's what I said there. And as we know, uh, humankind is composed of seven bodies. We have a physical body and an etheric body, plus two additional bodies in a lunar state, which we know are the astral and the mental lunar bodies, which we all possess. Then there's three bodies that we do not yet possess, but must create through transmutation. Transmutation of the energies and elimination of the ego is kind of a simultaneous process and what's needed to create these bodies. Excuse me, is yes. that... Uh, only Sorry, uh, transmutation, does that only refer to uh, the sexual magic, or is it through, like you said, also through... Uh, eliminating the egos. Right. It's both. It's both. And the main way of eliminating the ego is by using that energies. You don't have to have a like a, a, partner. a partner. You don't have to have a partner. Okay. Because there's so much work that you have to do before you'd even be ready. Yeah. If you have a partner, they say it's quicker because now you're using twice as much energy and, you, and, and uh, it's helping 
awaken that kundalini force quicker. Okay. But without it, you can do it on your own with the. Okay. You can still do like the hamsa practices and the pranayama practices, and that and the, you know, the visualization practices of, of the kundalini rising up the spine, and then the brain, and then to the heart. This is this is what transmutation is, okay. and it can be done during the alchemical process, obviously too. And the three bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, Let me take the rushing. I keep rushing. <laughs> yeah, when I'm, when I'm rushing. The three bodies <laughs> uh, that are the solar bodies mm -hmm. are. are well, we will we'll get into that, but there's the council body, oh, yes, what's called the yeah. buddhic body, and the atmic body. Plus, yeah. we have to create a solar astral and a solar mental, because we only currently have them in the lunar states. Okay. The so one. the number eight uh, signifies the solar uh, astral body? This is the astral body. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it's the eight sifferoth, if you remember from uh, yeah. emanation, that's, that's why right. it's known as the number eight. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah for sure. <laughs> no, stop me at any time. Okay, so the seven bodies and the seven dimensions are... Because this picture, I don't know if you, if you talk too much about it, but it shows seven different dimensions also, but, which I'll get into here. Um, there's the physical body, right? This is on the physical plane, and this is this occupies dimensions one, two, and three. And we'll, we'll get into more about what that means. The etheric body is and the etheric plane. Basically, there's a, there's a, a world or a plane for every body, too. Yeah. Just like you have a physical body, you have a physical world, so that's why it's written that way. That's in the fourth dimension. The astral body... And the astral plane or world is in the fifth dimension. The mental body and the mental plane is also in the fifth dimension, as you can see from this picture here. Um, the council body and the council plane is in the sixth dimension. The Buddhic <coughs> body and the Buddhic world is also in the sixth dimension. The atmic body and the atmic plane is also in the sixth dimension. So you can see, like, this dimension holds three different planes of existence that are related to one another, and that's why they're within one dimension, like one particular dimension. Then the seventh dimension is above the seven bodies of man and is reserved for the three logos. I don't know if they've talked too much about this yet, but they, like Lee may have talked about the three logos, which are the, the father, which is the first logo, Kiva. Um, the second logos, which is the son, which is Hokma. And the third logos, which is Vina, understanding the Holy Spirit. So this is the original, the origin of the Trinity. It's also the origin of the Trinity in the Hebraic tradition, but they wouldn't call it by the Christian terms. But, they, but it is the original the original idea of the Trinity. So here are the dimensions, once again, just to, just to show. This is what's called zero dimension, because this is the, goes up into the, the aim, what we're calling the aim self, or God, the absolute abstract space, it's called. It's a really it's the <coughs> level of being that we can't comprehend at all because it's the opposite of everything we are, right? without form, that kind of thing. Then the seventh is called the Logoic, because it's the three logos. Like Kir, Hokma, and Bina. The sixth dimension is the dimension of the law and has Hasid, Gabur, and Tifrith. This is where we'll talk about the karma and the people keeping score and all that stuff when we get into that. The fifth dimension is, is the desire in the mind, as you may remember, from the astral body being the body of desire, the uh, mental body being the body of the mind. Uh, the fourth dimension is time and the first three dimensions are length, width, and height. So it gets pretty concrete and then pretty abstract. But we've seen the spiritual ladder kind of ascend that way. We've got length, width, height, time, desire, mind, law, legoic, and then no dimension. But we'll go into this further. Um, let's see. From the physical to the spiritual, the sephiroth represent, Malkuth represents the physical body. Like we said, each one of these represents a specific body. Yasad is the etheric body. Like whenever they say talk about the etheric body and they go over and they point to that picture, it's because this represents that body and that entire principle. Hot is the astral body. Netzach is the mental body. Tifred is the council body. Gabur is the buddhic body. Hased is the atmic body. And then Kir, Hokma, and Bina represent the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, as we previously mentioned. And Da'ath represents the alchemical process of transmutation that must be accomplished in order to ascend the ladder. It's basically it's that knowledge. Yes. So the Holy yeah. Spirit is also known as the Divine Mother, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And we're going to get into each one of these in depth. We'll talk about that too. But I think we're going to start at the bottom where we are right now. So Malkut, which in English is kingdom, if you remember. That's the Hebrew is Malkut, English kingdom. This is the physical body in the physical world. And if we look at that, we're like, this one will make more sense to us because we're living it. 
So this is dimensions one, two, and three, which gives us space, like physical, at actual space, in the form of length, width, and height. And everything in the physical world is made up of this. <coughs> we talked about in the previous lecture that everything in the physical world is defined by weight and measure and separated by space. So this is like, it's been descended down and defined by, you know, the emotions and the instincts, and now everything's so separate that we all occupy our own space. We're all separated by space. This is the physical world. All things in the physical world are separated by space and distance and defined by measurement. I threw this picture in because I, was, I went so crazy on the original lecture. I didn't put this one in because there's too much information. But this just shows the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet and how they created the physical universe. The red ones, if you remember, the three mothers and <clears throat> the blue ones are the seven doubles. At the, at the ends of the three mothers and then the 12 elementals. It's just, it just shows in concept how the space was created. Oh, also, by the way, I didn't mention to everybody, but Ed's working tonight on getting the lectures up. So they should be hopefully up tomorrow for you guys to see. That's the, that's, that's the plan, yeah. He said he's, he was going to come. He said, no, I'm going to stay home and do this. We're dragging our heels on that. We had to get all kinds of passwords and clearances and stuff. So we got it now. So Okay, yeah, so we're talking about physical space in the physical world. Uh, the physical body is made up of the minerals and organic materials that make up the physical world. This is, that's pretty clear. The physical body is merely the, vis the vehicle used to interact with the physical world. It's not, it's not a concept we think about too often, but your physical body is what separates you from the physical world. Without this, how would you interact in this plane? You know, mm -hmm. With the astral body, you can move in the astral world, and uh, with the different bodies, you can move in the different worlds. It always brought up some point of confusion with me that I haven't cleared up still is the idea of, uh, what do they call it, remote viewing, where you're viewing the physical world with your astral body, just because I've never been able to experience that. The idea, the idea of placing a separate body into a separate world is a little bit beyond what I can understand at this point, but they say it's possible. I've, I've never, per, per, I, maybe just because personally I've never had an astral experience that didn't happen in the astral plane. I've seen, like, say, I, what I appeared to be my physical body, but it was from the astral plane perspective, so it didn't look exactly like it does. But uh, it can be done. Somebody better than myself, maybe. Mm -hmm. So the physical body is the boundary that separates you from the physical world. The physical body connects us to the mineral kingdom and all things composed of the mineral materials of this world. Um, this, this is just because our body is made up of these materials. Yes? What does that mean, the physical body is the boundary that separates you from the physical world? What does right. that mean? Well, like, as we're in the physical world right now, we're mm -hmm. experiencing it through our physical body. Right. So in, in my mind, the way I'm trying to understand it is if we didn't have a physical body, how would you experience the physical world? I mean, to, in our own minds, it seems like we are the, the center of the universe. But in reality, this physical world would exist down here if you guys were all here and I was somewhere else. And I wasn't here. It wouldn't mean that this place didn't exist. This, the physical world, but we need a vehicle to, to mm -hmm. interact with that and experience that. So the physical body would be the vehicle of that, made up of the minerals of the same material of this world, right? The minerals and organic material. And, you know, through our five senses is how we interact with this physical world. That's kind of the concept I was trying to get across. Does it make a little bit of sense? Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I was reading it somehow that mm -hmm. it separates us from the physical world. But well, in my mind, I'm thinking if we didn't have this, to, you know, oh, um, oh I see what you're saying. Like we're somewhere else. Distinguish us, yeah. like, or yeah, yeah. I, I know what you mean. Sure, now. like if we didn't have the physical body, maybe we blend into the physical world and just be part of it, as opposed to experiencing it as an individual. Yeah, it may, I think it may be a word of that confusing me. I apologize. Okay, so Malkut is the physical world as we've been talking about. And now what it means more esoterically to ourselves is that uh, the physical world is subject to laws of karma, return and recurrence, the pendulum, a lot of the laws you guys talked about in phase A and phase B. This is kind of what govern the physical world. Um, the physical world is the valley of bitterness, the kingdom of Malkut, the kingdom of samsara. The wheel of samsara incessantly turns and the ego comes and goes. It disincarnates and returns, always suffering, always searching without finding. This kind of is what defines the physical world and what it means to us spiritually. That it is in the physical world that the ego keeps uh, reincarnating into different personalities kind of thing. We're not, we're not a complete being. We, don't have, we haven't incarnated our souls yet even. Or even the, the, the lowest level of soul. We have the essence, right? You guys remember this? We have the essence, which is the, the same 
is like a fraction of the soul, a spark, sparks of the soul. And that's wrapped in ego. And then through this world, we're subject to karma and, and return and recurrence. The same things keep happening to us. The law of the pendulum, we're happy, we're sad, we're happy, we're sad. Mm -hmm. Then you die. Mm -hmm. And then you come back and repeat it over again until you start awakening. And once you can create these higher bodies, you can free yourself from that, the wheel of samsara and be above that. Yeah, this is an old uh, medieval picture showing it. Uh, I don't know if they're exactly trying to show the wheel of samsara principle, but it works well. They might be showing that you could be king one day and poor the next, but it's basically the, the principle of the wheel of samsara is there. You're king on top, and then you're falling to the precipice below. And that's a, that's a law. We can't control that. We, the more we think we can control it, the, the less control we have over it. So, but also the physical world and the physical body is where we must eliminate ego and waken consciousness here and now. Th this is the whole point of the physical world. So we can awaken our consciousness. It, it kind of gives you the tools you need to do that. Um, in some of his, uh, of his works, you can do that from the astral plane, and that's, you gain consciousness in the astral plane, you continue to work, you can do it from that way. But the, the, the main uh, purpose of Samael Ambour's work is to show that it can be done in one lifetime in this world. And that's, that's the main crux of his teachings. So uh, the true being is the spirit, and the being still has not entered into the human being because the I has invaded the kingdom of the soul, so the ego. Our true being mm -hmm. isn't within this body because we're full of ego. I'm speaking broad, you know, broad brush, so maybe somebody here is an awakened master. I'm not trying to pin a wheel. <laughs> into this one. But in general, this is in general. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so really, neither soul nor spirit have incarnated within the human being. The human being, the so-called human being, is still but a possibility. And that's why in a lot of uh, Samael's works, he'll say the so-called human being or the intellectual animal mistakenly called man. He refers to us as that because he doesn't consider it to be a true being until you start incarnating those parts of your soul, the higher aspects of yourself truer aspects, that's why. Okay, so just as an overview of Malkut in the physical body, the physical world, we see that, just as a reminder, it's just the translation is kingdom in English. It's a tenth sephira on the tree of life, you know, a tenth and last. Uh, it's the physical body. It represents the physical world. It occupies dimensions one through three, which are length, width, and height, which define, measure, separate everything in the physical world. Physical body connects man to the mineral kingdom, just only in the sense that our body's made out of those materials. I want to keep reiterating that because it doesn't mean that you're in the infernal regions of the mineral kingdom because that's something totally different. But just that our body's made out of the same materials. Uh, the physical body is the vehicle needed to interact with the physical world. And that's what I was trying to say with that one slide that was maybe a bit confusing. And uh, the physical body can be the instrument for the ego or for the essence, as we've seen. Right? You get the personality, the ego, and the essence. So the, the personality is, say, the parameters that would define you. Like for me, the personality would be, say, white, Caucasian, male, I don't know, metal working class, I don't know, you know, just whatever you're a subject to and the parameters you have to work within. And, uh, and then within that, I have all my egos that there's tons of, and then a little bit of essence in there somewhere. This is the idea with all of this. So uh, we'll go on to the next one, unless there's any questions about physical body, physical world. Now, it's kind of straightforward. Okay, let me know if, let me know if there's questions because we can answer. So, Yasad, which is foundation. This is known as the etheric body and the etheric world. Okay. So, I picked this picture specifically because it demonstrates, in my mind, what the etheric body is. Being, yeah, it's mm -hmm. shock. It is closely linked to the physical body, as we'll see. So, uh, this dimension is, is the fourth dimension, which is time. Right? We've got some Einstein stuff going on over here. Uh, but the etheric body places the physical body within the dimension of time. And that's really what constitutes the physical world now, right? So we've got length, width, height, time. So we're separated by space. Space is separated by distance. Distance is measured in time. And you, you can't really have, can't have a physical body without the etheric body. You can't have the physical world without the etheric world. They're codependent upon each other. Um, length, width, and height plus time equals the physical world, as we just mentioned. And the physical plus the etheric equals energy, matter, space, and time. And uh, this, this just sort of shows it. This was just from a science book, but I thought it was interesting. You got space and time, so and what, space and time and energy and matter. 
So it's like the physical and the etheric and how they meet. And you can see that, and we'll see from the next slides that they're more closely linked than just this. For example, there's the etheric body again. The etheric body is known as the vital body also. You might have come across this. Whenever they say vital body, they're talking about the etheric body. They're interchangeable terms. The etheric vital body is the superior part of the physical body. And this is why it's called the vital body, because it's vital to, to physical life. The etheric body directs all biological, physical, and chemical activities that occur in the body. That's why you don't have to think consciously about pumping your heart or where your blood's going, or you don't have to think about all these chemical processes that go on. That's the job of the etheric body. That's what it does. Uh, the etheric body animates and penetrates the physical body. So it surrounds us, it's inside of us, it's what, you know. So it can have an influence of our physical body, right? What's that? The etheric body can have an influence oh, yeah. of our physical body. Absolutely. Uh, through our thoughts, right? Sure, yeah. The, the world of thoughts is a little bit higher, but it does come through the, the etheric body. The etheric body, the etheric, etheric body. If you see, um, the etheric body were not. If the sorry, if the etheric body was not connected to the physical body, the physical body would succumb to death and decomposition. Okay. The etheric body is what's give, was, is what's giving the physical life, basically. So, which is pretty interesting. It's also related to time. And there's some other authors. Um, I guess what the names aren't too important, but. I would say, you know, when you have a, or you've heard of people who have a near-death experience and their life flashes before their eyes, it's because this etheric body is detaching itself from the physical body, which it never does, and going with the astral body, and that detachment brings the idea of time with it into the astral plane, which isn't, you know, com confined to time. So all the time flashes before your eyes like an instant. That's one specific author's. But like, if you have an astral projection, I don't know if you know, so you know the body that leaves your physical body when you're lying in the bed is the astral body, right? And the physical body stays stays in the bed with the etheric body. The etheric body wouldn't go with the astral body unless you died. Because because as your astral body leaves, the etheric's staying there keeping the physical alive. Yeah? Okay, uh, just as the uh, etheric body affects the physical body, does the physical body also have an effect on the etheric body? Sure. Yeah. Like I mean, if uh, someone who's an alcoholic and drinks too much, mm -hmm. would that also affect the etheric body? Sure, it would. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, it would, because they are so codependent on each other. And actually, when you hear people talk about auras and stuff like that, they're talking about this etheric body that they okay, can so see. Your, your aura. Is your aura. Right there. And if you're damaging your physical body, yeah. they say your aura yeah. would be dull. Or yeah. If you say you have a liver problem, I've heard then then in the etheric body you see like. Apparently, you, you can see it by color and stuff like that. I wouldn't know exactly from seeing it, but, but you see would like your aura a, be maybe a different color. Yeah, or exactly. Dark or yeah, it has different know, colors to it. It would show yeah. a, a, an injured area and that kind of thing. And yeah. obviously, with like alcoholism or drug addiction, it affects the physical body, which in turn affects this etheric body. Yes, because uh, as the case, he uh, was known to be able to see mm -hmm. uh, the aura of a person, sure. and if someone was angry, he would see red. The aura yeah. would be red, and he would send them home. He would say, "Come back when you're uh, mm -hmm. more at peace, or more sure. calm, or whatever." And that particular effect would be the the higher the astral body affecting the etheric body, because as we'll see, the astral body is the body of passions, so anger and stuff like that. But if you're physically injured, you you'd see that also in your etheric body. Yeah, there's there some people who could see auras. Sure. Yeah, I've heard of this too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't doubt it. I give everybody the benefit of the doubt. I thought I could. At one time, I'd meditate for a long time on a candle, at the fire, and then just look at the the small shadow around mm -hmm. the flame, mm -hmm. and I just try and fixate on that, and then I use that as a focal point when I close my eyes. And then after a while, I thought I could see that around people, you know, and plants. Sometimes I thought every everything, everything has this little shadow yes, around that's it. That's true. And that's why I think. True. You can you train your mind to see. Yeah, and I think if, if you watch a movie that has a blue screen, I think that's why it looks so weird. Because even though we can't always conscious that we're seeing this, internally we're picking that up. And if you see a blue screen, it's just like the, the, the edge of the person in the background, and it's not really like that. I think we can all perceive a little bit of that, that aura. We don't use the aura, the word aura around here too much, but it's just a term that we can use to define sort of the parameters of the etheric body if that makes sense. And then we got, the etheric body connects us to the vegetable and plant kingdom uh, because the etheric body or vital body is related to reproduction and promulgation. The etheric body is, we'll see, 
everything in nature that carries within itself the seed to further its species is connected to an etheric body. This teaching is slightly outside of Samuel and Moore's teachings, but not, but not doesn't go against any of his teachings. This is from a, a different guy, Rudolf Steiner, but uh, his teachings are, are they, they mesh so well. And this part I like particularly right? that the physical body made of the physical materials connects us to the mineral kingdom. Now this etheric body that has that gives us life, it's the same body that you know connects us to the plant world and everything else that has life within it. Not sentient life, but like plant type of consciousness, right? Reproduction and transformation are processes of the etheric body. Sex must be in itself the most elevated creative function. And no one can incarnate the internal Christ without having edified the temple upon the living stone, which is sex. And we talked about this before already, that you don't have to have a partner and do all this, because there's so much work to do ahead of this. And the way that Saul and my own war would talk about it is, if I could just use maybe my own analogy, would be, you say, oh, I don't want to go into the temple because I don't have the key. But you can walk to the temple, and by the time you get there, maybe someone's holding a key there for you, waiting for you. And he says this sort of thing, like, he was addressing men particularly. They can't blame his wife if she doesn't want to do this practices and stuff. It's not because her fault. It's because you're not ready. And kind of like when the student is ready, the master will appear. It's that kind of idea. There's so much work with the elimination of the ego and the consciousness that it doesn't all. It's not. It's not this or nothing. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, want, I really want to get that across because well, a lot by of people, the time you get there, you know, you might sure. have eliminated a lot of ego and absolutely, focus yeah. and concentration. And yeah, absolutely. So you mean you can do the work by yourself uh, you without, can. like, incarnate Christ? Mm. Is that what you mean? You, you, can go, you can go pretty far. I think you, you can eliminate up to 50% or a little bit more of the ego on your own, is what Samael teaches. So at, one, at some point you won't need this, but at the starting point you don't. And the, it is a long path that can take more than one life, but Samael gives us directions on how to do it within one life. But how about the creation of the solar bodies? The creation of the solar bodies, uh, when you eliminate the ego, you start creating these solar bodies. So um, you can have a like different degrees of, of solar body, kind of like as they say, I think they said we're 3% consciousness right now. <coughs> and so if you woke in 50% consciousness, I think leave, I don't know exactly the numbers, but you would be conscious in the astral plane and that kind of thing. You can continue to work from there. Like, about being single? Um, from from being single, you can go, you can get pretty far. You can get far. Yeah. Because if every creation uh, needs the, the two forces, yeah, I don't think you will be able to create uh, solar bodies. The idea is is you can't you you need them at some point because you can't you need the extra power to to start incarnating the higher bodies. Just the exact cutoff point, I'm not exactly sure if it's the astral body or the or higher than that. I believe it's higher than the astral body that you need it for. Maybe the council? Yeah, possibly the council, because that, that's that's the first incarnation of the lowest form of your soul. But I could I could look into that for you. Like I said, I don't have all the answers. But if it takes more than one lifetime, mm -hmm. you can, you can. This way, like <laughs> like if you make some progress now, eliminating egos, exactly. and you get some of the bodies in this lifetime, sure. it won't take you your next life. You'll yeah. be closer to it. Yeah, it exactly. Takes so many hours. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I think you can go to yeah. like fifty percent mm -hmm. without creating yeah. new bodies, because a, a, per, a single person cannot. I, I don't think it would be possible. There, there, there is practices, the pranayama practices, and the hamsa that you can still be transmuting energies while single. There's, there are specific single practices that. Some but that doesn't people. mean the creation of the bodies. Well, the creation of the bodies is a lot of work because you have to eliminate, like, say. It's almost 100% of ego has to be eliminated for the council body. Below that, below that you don't. Almost 100% of the ego has to be eliminated. Yeah, because the ego, because the, the, the we'll, and we'll get there too, but the uh, the cause of the ego is within the council body. So you'll see the seeds of it, and where it comes from, and you can still be eliminating it. But uh, there is, there's, there's so much work you can do before that. It doesn't have to seem like such a daunting task mm -hmm. either. I know it can yeah. seem like that. It seems like that to all of us sometimes for sure, but it also feels a little bit like a like you're on a fulfilling path, I find, because I feel like I'm doing something mm -hmm. instead of just being tossed around in the wind kind of thing. But uh, I feel like I'm dragging my heels here, but it's good. This this also might be one of the one of the longer lectures. These first two that I had to do have been the biggest ones, and then from there on they get a little 
but these are pretty intense lectures. So the ninth sphere, the cubic stone of Yasada, you've heard, you've heard this, we've heard this term before. And this is the alchemical practice, the cubic stone of Yasada. Uh, the eye is dissolved with alchemy, desire is the root of the eye, desire is transmuted with alchemy. So that's how we start eliminating ego. You can eliminate it without it by self-observation and uh, death and motion. It's just that alchemy is the most powerful way to do it. Yasad is the vital or etheric body. Yasad is the foundation of the third logos, which is the Holy Spirit. So the foundation of the Holy Spirit is, in, is within Yasad, right? Which is the ninth sphere, as you can see. That's why they call it the ninth sphere, the Kibbutzon. You see where the ninth sphere is always related to the sexual organs. Um, the sexual forces, which are the living foundation of our <coughs> physiology, gravitate in Yasad. The Holy Spirit resides in Yasad. <coughs> it is convenient to clarify that if we consider Yasad as a foundation, it is clear that it is found in the sexual organs. And Yasad is the sexual organs. So, and it, it's based on the principle that from these sexual organs and the, the sexual energies themselves are what creates. Obviously, we know that. That's what creates life, that's how you get a baby, that's what makes adolescents go through puberty. And then the idea is that around the age 21 or so, it depends on what school you follow, um, that energy is done creating, you're basically the person that you're going to be. But the idea is that it's not meant to just be wasted and then stop creating there. At that age, you're now ready to start creating higher bodies. And that the, uh, so it would be like the continuance of... I guess like puberty, except for now it's not a natural process, it has to be done with the will. And a lot of people say that this kind of thing is, is, is unnatural, but then it's just, they say, well, what, what's natural? What's natural about cooking our food or wearing clothes, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yes? What's the, uh, what's the significance of the age 21? Like, is there a, some sort of numerology uh, like thing to it? Um, I'm not exactly particular, at least sure about that. I just know that in, uh, like, say, the teachings of Steiner from the Waldorf School, they say that's when, that's when the physical body is done developing. So the sexual force isn't being used for the physical body anymore. Also, I see in masonry you have to be 21 to join. Uh, the tarot and numerology, Ed would know more about. I studied the Hebrew stuff. He studied the tarot cards. Of Greek. So, but he, he um, do you know what the, the tarot deck twenty one? Um, no, I'm not familiar with it. Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting because I, I recently just turned twenty one. Oh, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, see, you're on the right path. You're ahead of time. See, you're like times <laughs> ahead already. Yeah, it's like, that way. That's you're good. on the right path. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's where they're supposed to be right now. That's the whole idea. Okay, so as a quick overview, I think I, I think this one's going to go a little bit late, guys. I might not be able to do a meditation, but that's good. It's okay. Sometimes I go like this. So the Knights of Fair on the Tree of Life. <laughs> We've had five classes like this We're before, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. So uh, this is the etheric body, the etheric world. It's in the fourth dimension, which is, as we said, related to time. And more, more uh, specifically, time in a linear fashion, right? That's the idea of why when you go out in your astral body, you can have an experience that seems to be over the course of four days in, the, in your dream. And then you wake up and it's been two minutes of a nap, you know, because they don't correlate with each other that way. So it's time in a linear fashion. Uh, the vital body is a superior part of the physical body that directs organic life, as we've seen. That's why it's known as the vital body. The etheric body connects man to the plant kingdom because they all have this life principle within them also. And the ninth sphere is related to alchemy and the transmutation of sexual energy. As you've seen, because uh, Yasad relates to the sexual organs, it's also the cubicle stone of Yasad is the, I forget that saying, they say it around here all the time, but you know, the f Peter is the stone that Jesus will build his church on, it's the same, mm -hmm. has the same connotation of the cubicle stone. Okay, moving on, we got Had, which is glory in English, there's uh, other translations also, that's a pretty good one. This is the astral body, and the astral world, so this is a picture of a woman astral picture. So the fifth dimension is desires and passions. Right? The astral world is the world of desires. I just sort of picked that. Some of these pictures I picked randomly, but that one I thought maybe is the, the desires controlling the person. Maybe it's not. I don't know. The astral world is governed by the moon. That is why astral projections become easier during the waxing moon and more difficult during the waning moon. That's, that's, just, a, that's just a process you may be able to find when you're practicing with astral projection. A full moon is easier to astral project than a, than a waxing moon. The idea, too, is these bodies are also lunar kind of thing. 
Um, the astral plane is really the plane of practical magic. Um, I like this picture a lot too. Oh, yeah. I use, I've had an astral experience where I've looked up and it looked like something crazy like that, so I always like using this picture for that, but it might mean something different. But, uh, but yeah. And so it's called the, the plane of practical magic, and that's because the messages that descend from the world of pure spirit become symbolic in the astral plane, right? We were talking about this a little bit earlier, but the idea of all these different laws in the astral plane of, of the law of opposites, you know, and analogies and allegory all applies there because of that, nothing's straightforward now. The messages come down in, in sort of like story forms or things we have to decipher. Also, you'll find stuff like we place a lot of importance on, like, say, the esoteric pentagram that you guys learned about. So we could have it hanging up there, and here it just looks like we have a star. In the astral plane, you can see the forces or the effects that it has. Yeah, I think you guys did, like, uh, Bellaline and those kind of things. Sometimes it seems a little weird doing that here. But the effect, if you, if you do that kind of stuff in the astral plane, it can actually be seen. You can actually see what you're doing. And I've had some experience with that. I can verify some of that, and other instructors can verify more of that kind of stuff. But, yes? I just want to ask about desires. Mm -hmm. Is that not an ego? Yeah. Yeah, so it is. You, you have to, if you, you know... Like what sort of things are they talking about? Desires, anything? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You're not just having to the, do with sex. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, like your desires for anything, maybe making yourself look good, or desires yeah, okay, to so be wealthy and all kinds. It's kind of like the passions. Yeah. No. The, okay. the egos and everything. It's basically the realm of the egos. You can see egos more really, more like realistically. It seems, or you can uh, see uh, uh, the egoic side of yourself in the astral plane. And so when you have a thought or, or a passion or desire in the astral plane, you can see it manifest. It's not internal anymore, it's external now. That's why it's known as the, uh, the plane of practical magic. Where did you get that uh, picture here? Oh, yeah. oh, this one? Mm -hmm. uh, I, got a, I got all these pictures on the internet. From I think it's in random the stuff. site has... Yeah. Well, I'm not sure the exact that origin of that picture or where the book it's in. Oh, okay. uh, it is pretty famous. I've seen it in a lot of the galleries. Yeah. That's very nice. Yeah. yeah. If you type in like beyond the firmament or something like that, it'll come up. Astral projection maybe sometimes. Okay, all of the creatures of nature are lunar. They possess a lunar astral body, which is a cold protoplasmic body of a bestial remnant of the past. And you can see this uh, animals all also have a uh, astral bodies, right? And they and they're ruled pretty much entirely by their desire or instinct. They don't have they can't they don't have a way of rising above it. Okay? The lunar astral body connects us to the animal kingdom and all things in nature that have instinctual desires. That's what this body really is. This is the queen of the night from the magic food. Yeah, I don't know if you guys have talked about that player. Maybe we talked about it in the second chamber. But there's a lot of really cool esoteric stuff going on there. It's also highly masonic, so I'm, I'm down with it. But uh, the queen of the night represents basically the physical world in that play. Yeah. What was the name of the play? Uh, it's called the, the Magic Flute. Oh, the Magic Flute. Yeah, Mozart and Schechenator. Okay. Yeah. There is a lot of modern literature written about astral projection, but we must realize that New Age occultists are used to projecting themselves with their ego in order to travel in the sublunar regions of nature through time and space. So we all we all astral project every night. Every time we have a dream, that's a that's a memory of an astral projection we've had. We can begin to gain more and more consciousness. But we have to be cautious because it is still sort of the realm of ego and we take a lot of the ego with us so we can be projecting mostly with our with our egos and that that can you know get into dangerous territories where you think maybe you're seeing something really profound but it could be the ego but generally in the astral plane if if there's ego there you'll know it or sense it or feel it or you'll, you'll see like you'll have maybe a demonic presence it's different for everybody so i don't want to talk in too much of specifics but uh what Sama and War are saying here is that there's different regions, sublunar regions, like more of an infernal region or a lower region would be where you astral project with your, with your lunar astral body. And then when you make your solar astral body, you have more consciousness and it'd be more true, like a truer picture of the astral world and what we're seeing. Right now, even when we have some consciousness in the astral world, we're still kind of viewing it like this, you know? And when we're dreaming, it's like this. But then when you have a solar body, it'd be the, it'd be the most amount of truth in that world. Kind of um, there are many pseudo-esoterists and pseudo-occultists that mistake the ego with the astral body. 
Um, this is a quote from Samuel. I'm not sure which one, which authors he's referring to exactly, but we just have to bear, keep in mind that we have this idea of these egos, and we always have to be fighting, and we always have to be guarding yourself against them, particularly in the astral plane. Not for like any life-threatening reason, but the idea that you could be having experience and talking to somebody, and all of a sudden you get distracted by something and then fall back asleep, and that distraction is the ego. The ego will always try and wrap you up within sleep so that it can take, steal your energies, right? So when you're not, when you're not checking your ego, it's living through you. So you know, someone says they don't like my glasses and I get mad at them. That's that's the ego of rage finally gets to manifest itself through me. So you gotta keep yourself in check, you know, so that you can be a vehicle for the being and not for the ego. Basically, the legitimate and authentic astral body is the solar astral body. You see this woman with the astral body. You got the silver cord going there. Thank you. I heard it's also it's goes through umbilical cord. But I wouldn't get caught up on the details. You know? We do not yet possess the solar astral body. Speaking again in general, I'm not trying to pigeonhole anybody here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, if you have that silver cord, if you've seen the silver cord from your body, does mm -hmm. that mean you have a soul? Is that what you're saying? Then it's a solar astral. Uh, well, no, the no. silver cord connects your, your astral body to your physical body. Okay, so it could be the lunar astral body. Yeah, it can connect yeah. the lunar yeah. astral body as well. It does, yeah. it does, in fact, connect the lunar astral body. Yeah. And then okay. once you create the solar astral body, it's just more of a, of a level of complete astral consciousness. But yeah. it's still connected by the silver cord. Okay. That's why even in Genesis, I forget the prayer, but you know the one about the, the doors being shut in the streets and, and the grinders cease. It talks about death. It says, lest the silver cord be loosed. Because once the silver cord is yeah. unattached anymore, then... That equals death, right? Yeah. So the solar astral body must be made of the flaming forge of Vulcan, the ninth sphere, which is alchemy. So anytime you hear something weird that doesn't make sense, it's always alchemy, basically. <laughs> flaming forge of Vulcan. <laughs> they have all kinds of words yeah, for it. Yeah. Um, so the ninth sphere. This is how we do. These kind of pictures are good. This is taken from an ancient alchemical text from the from the early medieval times, um, called the Philosopher's Rosary, and it has twelve different pictures. Of the, of the process of alchemy. And like in, in medieval alchemy, maybe we'll do a lecture on that one time in school, because all those pictures and all those books are talking about this practice, but it's really veiled. It seems less veiled to us, but if someone, you know, walking down the street said, what is it? there's a guy, a girl, and a dove sitting in a fountain, it doesn't mean anything. But uh, when you sort of have this idea of alchemy and the sexual forces and uniting and the dove being the Holy Spirit that is a result of that, then it starts to have a little more meaning. Okay, so the astral body and the astral world. Pod, which is glory in English. I always try and do this because, like I said, sometimes we think that Hod is some kind of thing that, that's a, an arbitrary name we have to memorize that's a place called Hod. But it's just, it's just literally the word glory, which we use to represent the astral body, the astral world. Uh, it's the eighth cipher on the tree of life. It's the astral body, the astral world. It's the fifth dimension and particularly the plane of desire in the fifth dimension. Uh, the lunar astral body connects man to the animal kingdom, as we said. They're all sentient beings that are, you know, defined by uh, instinctual desire for whatever it may be. It doesn't have to be purely sexual desire, but just food, shelter, all that kind of stuff. The solar astral body must be created through alchemy or the transmutation of the sexual energies and the elimination of the ego. That's the only way to, to create that. Solar astral body equals conscious astral projection. And uh, there's also other teachings within, within Samael's books that will say that maybe in previous lives you've created a solar astral body, mm -hmm. and in this life you may be just slightly disconnected from it. So it would take less work to, to, to get back there, because it's still there waiting for you, but somehow you fell back into sleep, you know, somehow, through uh, the loss of the Holy Spirit or the, the losing of the sexual energies, basically. That, that's how that's how it materializes on this plane, but in the higher spiritual realms, you know, it takes on the more of the spiritual aspects of that concept. So you don't want to think like the original Adam and Eve actually did physical stuff because they're spiritual principles, but because of those principles and what they stood for, when it crystallized down to the material, it's expressed as the losing of the energies for the gratification of the self, basically, not for the building of the higher bodies, which is actually serving the higher being, right? When you build the higher bodies, you're serving your highest being, you're not serving yourself or your own egoic desires. So next, next we have Netzach, 
which is victory. This is the mental body in the mental world. So, uh, and as we remember from the dimensions, it's in the same dimension, the fifth dimension. It's in the fifth dimension, same as the astral body, but it's a different plane, the plane of thoughts. The, where the astral is the plane of feelings, this is thought. So the fifth dimension is the mind. Metzah is the mental world, the cosmic mind, the mind of the human being. The mental world is the superior part of the astral world, and thus both worlds are separate planes within the same dimension. Here's what I just sort of said there. Hopefully that makes sense that there's one dimension of this, of the astral and the mental are in the same dimension, but they're two different aspects, desire and mind, so closely related that they're in the same dimension. In the mental world, there are many temples that must be conquered with the point of the sword. So this is direct quote from Samael, and the point of the sword is the will. And he'll be referring to egos of a mental nature, which, as we know, are more devastating than the actual uh, desire egos, or the, the emotional egos, because that's when you start getting to calculate, calculating how you can you know, acquire stuff over top of your neighbor, or how you can maybe screw somebody out of something so you can get it instead. This, these are kind of like a little bit more malicious egos, right? Because you're putting thought into it. Okay, so those would uh, be more like detrimental. Like yeah, they're, they're more, they are more, more demonic or de detrimental type of ego. Yeah. Harder to conquer. You, you, you sort of would do it in stages, right? So the lunar mental body <laughs> is, a, is of a bestial nature, yeah. <laughs> that was a I thought it was pretty sweet. <laughs> um, what can I do? Yeah. The difference between beasts and the intellectual animals, mistakenly called human beings, is that human beings have been given intellectualism and the beasts only act instinctively. So now we see that the, the intellectual or mental body is kind of like the body that separates man. This is, I think, what's meant by man has dominion over the animals and the plants. Not that they're supposed to dominate them, but that we've received the intellect, whereas they haven't. So now we can start to make choices and, and start using our will where other say the animals and plants can't really do that, per se, right? And that's why they say like maybe the, the, the practice of alchemy is unnatural, mm -hmm. but everything we do is virtually unnatural, right? We're, we're not natural beasts. We're wearing clothes, we're cooking our food, we're driving in cars, nothing else in nature does this. But because we've been bestowed with the intellect, we can come up with this stuff and we can devise, and we can also use our intellect, you know, to build our higher bodies by choosing to do that willfully. When the mind cannot serve as an instrument for the innermost, which is the hi a higher part of our, our being, then it serves as an instrument for the ego. Right? So if you're not if you're not serving, say if you're not serving, how do we do? You're not serving the Lord. You're serving the devil. You have to serve a master. It's not the literal Lord or the literal devil. It's if you're not working towards self-realization, which is working towards the Father, then then you're working in the ego. What, whether it seems like you are or not, maybe maybe it seems like you're not. If it's not. It's not, if you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards, basically, is what it's saying here, is the idea. The innermost gives an order, but the mind reveals itself with its reasoning. And reasoning divorces the mind from the innermost. So this could be the idea that, like, intuition comes from a higher part of our being. I think Lee gives an example where maybe he says, um, you're driving down the street, and you get a, an idea, oh, I should turn left right now, I get this int intuitional flash, and I think, wait, left's the wrong way, it takes... It's, it, it makes my drive longer. I'm not supposed to go that way. I'm just going to keep going straight. And then there's a massive detour or a car accident. And you think, oh, I should have listened. But because the mind is being used by the ego and we're using it for lunar nature, we start reasoning away all of this intuitional stuff that we receive from the higher realms. So that, that's, why, that's why the mind can be more dangerous. Because it starts justifying. It starts reasoning. Rational. Rationalizing. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense in the physical plane to do this bellowing saying. I'm just, you know, calling on some name I don't understand and... I'm just not going to do it. Well, you should be doing it, but your mind will start rationalizing it this way because it says you can't see the effects of it in the physical world. Maybe there is no astral world. I'm just going to go eat some chips or something, you know? <laughs> Watch it. That's what we're trying to say here with the, with the mind is that, you know, if you thought beyond the mind, it could be more intuitional. And through the mind, we start rationalizing. And that's when you start maybe dividing yourself between other people and you're thinking, this religion is right because let me rationalize it and think about it. Yeah, it's totally different, you know, than this other religion or something. It's always it's always a problem seeing seeing like rationalizing with the mind. Um, what do we got? So the solar mental body must be built in the ninth sphere. Like everything else, this is the same pattern. It's creation of the bodies is done in the ninth sphere. 
the transmutation of the energies, and then eventually the alchemical process, right? So that won't be a surprise there. So how do we get the solar mental? The exact same ways you get all your bodies is through transmuting the energies, elimination of ego, and then alchemical practice also. Alchemical practice can, can be, you know... But we could do it on our own. On your own. Yeah, yeah. on your own. You can. You can eliminate parts Same of, with the astral. Same uh, with the astral, yeah. Solar body. Uh, is yeah. there a solar astral well, body? Well, there is a solar astral body, yeah, yeah. as we as we just uh, talked yeah. about. And that would be the solar uh, conscious astral travel and stuff. The exact cutoff of what you can do by yourself when you can't, I don't, I don't know uh, exactly. We'll find out for... I will. I will look into that for sure. I know. Okay, yeah. I'm a wolf getting in Japanese. Like, we're actually, I like, want to know how much time I have. Okay? Yeah. You know, you know, fine. There's so much work. Every every second is a chance to do the work. I can start answering you with some of these answers. Actually, I think Wolfgang's going to give us the lecture about that in the next phase. I'll just say that. <laughs> no, the next phase is uh, pre-chamber and then second chamber. This is the last phase. We must change from reasoning to discernment, the perception of truth, without the process of reasoning. So this is the idea of just perceiving the truth without reasoning or trying to like figure out, no, that doesn't make sense, or how can we fit that into this box or that box. Like uh, there's a, another famous occultist named Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, and she said, there's no religion higher than truth. I think that's a beautiful saying because it's so true. <laughs> so true. You wouldn't have all these differences. You can't say this one's right and that one's wrong. The only thing that's right is the truth. And if they both contain parts of it, then you can try and sort out what's true and what's not. But in the end, nothing's higher than truth. Religion is not more important than truth. It's better to practice meditation than to lose time reasoning. Because through meditation, we can talk with God, the innermost, the being, all these different aspects of ourselves. It's how we can communicate, receive you know, intuitional guidances or flashes of maybe stuff we should be doing or messages. We can only really get, we get this through meditation because that's when we're turning the ego off. We're turning the mind off basically. Trying, to, without creating the mental body, we're, we're kind of bypassing it. You know? By being receptive instead of you know, over, overbearing with our reasoning. So we need to finish with reason and awaken intuition. Because intuition is higher than reasoning. Because reasoning is like really calculated decisive Intuition is just knowing, you know, if you had intuition, if you've experienced intuition before, everybody has, I'm sure, on certain levels, on my, from minute things to bigger things, I'm sure. If you have an intuition about something, a gut feeling, you know, solar plexus. Okay, so, the solar mental body is the Christ mind. This is, this is depicted in the, in the uh, Christ drama. Uh, the mental body is the donkey we must ride in order to enter into the celestial Jerusalem. Probably heard that example already come up through the different phases because I seem to use it a lot. But the, the donkey represents the mind just because of its stubbornness and its animal nature. Mm -hmm. And so Christ riding it, and as we'll see, Jesus isn't really representing a historical man, but actually a cosmic principle. Uh, also, in some Kabbalistic texts like the Zohar, we talked briefly, they talk a lot about the donkey driver. And the donkey driver has whip and drives this donkey, but he's it's really you know, an allegory for this guy who's controlled his mind because he's never fallen into the same pitfalls as the other people are in that story. So it's kind of a common allegory using the donkey. Um, the mind, which is a slave of the senses, makes the soul disabled, just as the boat that the wind misleads upon the waters. Right? So they, they attribute a lot of different uh, importances or allegories to the story of Jesus walking on the water. This, this could be one interpretation. But the idea, like, the boat's getting tossed around by the water, and the guy's sinking because they're not in control of their own mind, so they're just, you know, being tossed around at the whim of the mind. But since the, the Christ force is above the mind and has control of the mind, and walk on the water. These are kind of interpretations I find a little more uh, inspiring than, say, literal interpretations, although some people can reconcile both. I, I don't see why not. I guess, you know, it's... It, Starts as a spiritual principle that it's allegorizing, maybe crystallizing with the material. Who am I to say? I don't know. But yeah, this is generally what this is uh, referring to the idea of him controlling the mind. So, Netzach, victory, is the seventh sephirah in the tree of life. It's the mental body, the mental world. It's dimension, it's the fifth dimension, which is the mind, you know, which is the superior part of the astral world, the mental world being the superior part of the astral world. 
The intellect separates the intellectual animal, mistakenly called man, from beasts or animals. That's the difference between us. The soul or mental body must be created through transmutation so that the mind can be used as an instrument for the innermost. Are there, is that pretty straightforward? Are there questions on the mental body? I think it is going to get a little more abstract from here. A little bit. Well, I, think we can, I think we can handle it. So, these constitute the four bodies of sin. And the reason we're going over some of this already, uh, stuff you guys already gone over, is because we're trying to show what that tree of life diagram is showing. So although it's a principle you already heard, these are the four bodies of sin as they're shown on the tree of life diagram, right? And the four bodies of sin being, I'm sure you remember, the physical body, the etheric body, the lunar astral body, and the lunar mental body. And they're called the four bodies of sin because within them you have a little bit of essence entrapped by the ego, enclosed by the ego. And the ego manifests itself through these four bodies, you know, causing the essence to sleep, as, as they say. Um, here's an old picture explaining the Trinity, but I like it because it looks like the Kabbalistic uh, tree of life, the, the four bodies of sin particularly. Um, the essence is the one that incarnates in its four vehicles, which are the four bodies of sin. The essence is dressed with them and remains bottled up within the psychological eye and the ego. So within these bodies is, is like we've said, the essence only. We haven't incarnated our souls, we haven't incarnated higher aspects of our souls, but just merely the essence, which is a fraction or a spark of the soul. The mental body, the body of desires, which is the astral body, and the ethereal body, along with the physical body, integrate the personality. This is, each one of us has this right now in this room. Everybody has these four bodies. At a minimum. The essence remains bottled up within the ego when penetrating these bodies. That which returns is a fraction of the human soul. The human soul is the, the lower half of what we call the soul, as we'll see. But this is basically, you know, talking about that concept of the of the essence reincarnating, that's what's returning and, and all of this thing. Does that make sense? Sorry. So now we're going to go on to Tiferet, which is beauty. This is the causal world and the causal body. It's the, in the sixth dimension, the dimension of the will and the law. The world of Tiferet is the world of willpower. It is a world which is beyond the mind, right? Because the mind is symbolizing the mental body, now we're going above that, the next higher body. It is a world of natural causes. In the causal world, one finds the cause that produces each eye, each ego. So this will be like the last glimpse of the ego as you're going up. This is There's still ego there, but it's just like you can determine the cause of it. The, the smallest seed, the, the tiniest bit, the first origins of the ego can be found in the causal world. The world of Tiferet, the world... Uh, in the world of Tiferet, the will of the Father is done on earth as it is in heaven. The idea is that it's, it's, it's the law and the will, but that you're starting to incarnate the will of the Father. So like, thy will be done on heaven as it is in earth. Thy will is your own internal higher being's will, and not your own egoic animal nature type of will. In the causal world, there are many bodhisattvas who work under the direction of their real beings. So bodhisattvas, I think, I'm a too familiar with all the Hindu words, but it's more like an awakened being or an enlightened person. And they're working under the direction of their real being, which is the higher aspect of themselves, because they've conquered the mind and the desires and, and the egos. And they've created those bodies that can start working under the direction of those higher bodies. The causal world is the world of music. Everyone who reaches this world must learn the fundamentals of music because music is the verb. If you remember from the first lecture on Kabbalah, how we've seen the verb creates. And the verb is what creates. In the causal world, the verb is expressed through music. So it wouldn't be like a physical words, but actually musical, the principles of music. In this sublime region, the music of the spheres is heard. So the idea that each orb... Yes? I have a question. Sure. Are all those composers, like, you know, like, um, all the ones? Mm -hmm. Yeah. World. Yeah. So that is generally generally accepted. 
as what's happening. Actually, in the same book, I didn't have time to put everything in. They say there's a great temple in the, in the, in the Kalsa world, and the director of that temple is who we knew as Beethoven. But he's uh, incarnating his higher beings. And that's how his music was so beautiful, because it came from this higher dimension. Particularly his ninth symphonies, and say the ninth symphonies also related to the ninth spheres, and that's that he was a partially, he might not have been like a fully awakened master, but at least his higher aspects he's incarnating through him and working through the physical plane. So that is generally what they say. Mozart, I guess, would be the same. Mozart, yeah. Just he, he was hearing the music from somewhere, right? Yeah, it would come from... just yeah. taking notes. And yeah, exactly. They're kind of like channeling, channeling it, let, letting yeah. his higher parts of themselves work mm -hmm. through. Not channeling in the sense of like yeah, modern channeling, yeah. but, but like this idea, oh. exactly, yeah. yeah. I don't know about which ones in, in particular, other than Beethoven, is mentioned by name by Salman War as being a master. It's kind of proud. So uh, the, in the causal world, one finds the law of the balance, the law of the cosmic justice and the masters of karma. One discovers that every cause has its effect and that each effect transforms itself into a cause. So now we're getting a little more abstract. But this idea of karma and which, say, realm uh, be all it's founded is in the sixth dimension. And if you're going to take something away from the slides, it might be that one. Because there is a test at the end of... Facey, and that question is directly on there. You might say, where does the masters of karma and Anubis reside, Anubis reside? be the sixth dimension, the causal, the causal world. If we do not create the causal body through the transmutation of our energies, then we will always be a victim of circumstance governed by the law of accidents and the law of return and recurrence. So the idea of the causal body is now we're coming more and more in tune with the law, and we're more aware of it, so we're not like you know, on the tarot deck, the fool card, he's stepping off the cliff, not watching where he's going. That demonstrates how we are in the state that we're in here. We're not really aware of the law, and we're just kind of victims of, of the law. Accidents, karma, return, recurrence, until we start creating these higher bodies and eliminating the ego, you know, and, and becoming more conscious of them. Then we'll start learning what these laws are, and we can live in tune with them. Is the idea. Yes? What is the law? Law of accidents is a law that exists that some things happen for as an accident. It's just a law of like so like how we're talking about the woman who got ran over. It's probably karmic and she's paying a karmic debt. Oh, Could be a law of accident too. Oh, okay. Accidents do happen also is the idea. That that is one of the laws. I think I thought that maybe talked about it in phase A and B. Maybe they didn't. There's yeah. so many different laws. Yeah. The laws of accidents is that you know that law is out there and can affect somebody. Whether it happens on purpose or not, I don't, I don't know. It seems like it would not be an accident then. But it's one of those laws like return and recurrence and karma. You know, and like, karma gets used a lot, this word, but it's, it's interpreted more as karma is the debt you have to pay, basically, to bring yourself into balance. <clears throat> so it's not really like you're being punished, but you're being brought into balance. The idea is if you have excess karma, it's actually called dharma. Right? So dharma is when you have more good deeds that you can pay your karmic debts with. Sometimes people say, I'm doing this for good karma. Well, that would be dark. But that's just, you know, that's splitting hairs and we're being picky now. But uh, Tifra is the human soul. This is what it represents on the tree of life. It's the human soul, which is uh, sometimes it's called the animal soul. It's only because it's, it's the lower section of the soul. There's two halves of the soul. Tifra is the human soul. The Kelsal body is the vehicle for the human soul. That's why you have to create the Kelsal body. You create that energetic body, and then the human soul can incarnate into it, can fill it. Um, the intellectual animal, mistakenly called man, has incarnated with him, within himself a fraction of the human soul. That's what the essence is. The essence is a fraction of the human soul, this particular human soul represented by Tifra, the, the sixth Sephira on the tree of life. The fraction is the essence, right? The essence is bottled up within all of the psychological aggregates which make the ego. The essence is the raw matter needed to build the causal body. That's why you have to eliminate ego and free essence. Because the freeing of essence starts to build these bodies as well. Because the bodies are built out of it. Essence is the raw matter that builds the body. You know? And the more of that you free, the more the more of the <clears throat> the more of that soul you can the more of that causal body you can start to create. And the more of the causal body you create, the more of the soul can incarnate. It's kind of the idea. I just picked that situ statue because it's it's the golden rider, but it shows like a golden body. I was kind of picturing it. And this is the Egyptians. Uh, 
<clears throat> we're showing the soul by this that symbols for the soul. The idea that I don't know if this guy's taking the soul away, which is what I would assume, but it's just an Egyptian symbol for the uh, soul. Okay, and to build the council bodies with this raw matter is tr through transmutation. Transmutation of the energies can be done through alchemy, as we've said, and can be done alone. And I'm looking into exactly what bodies you can get up to. I don't know if there's like a, a cutoff point, but I'll find out. Um, so Tiferet is, is beauty. It's the sixth Tiferet on the Tree of Life. It's the causal body, the causal world, you know, the world of the law, the, where the masters of karma reside. It's the sixth dimension, the dimension of the will and the law. Tiferet itself represents the human soul, and the causal body is the vehicle for the human soul, is the idea. The human soul must be built from the raw matter of the essence. The essence is what we have to free, because that's the material we need to build these bodies. The human soul must be created through transmutation. I, th I think that one's going to be at the end of every single one of these. It's not going to change. <laughs> <laughs> that one's not going to change. Yeah. So, and then, okay, so that's that's the seven bodies that you've learned about previously, that's what he calls them. Those are the seven bodies from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, wait, sorry. I'm getting way ahead of myself. <laughs> we have two more bodies to go still. That's cool, that's cool. So, uh, Gabura is severity, right? <laughs> this is the Buddhic body in the Buddhic world. Um, so this would be like the sixth body that we're talking about now. Uh, this is the sixth dimension still, it was just like the previous one was also in the sixth dimension. So this is related to the law also with karma, but particularly justice, the justice of karma in that. The Buddhic world is based on the law of justice. The Buddhic world is completely solar. So there's no more ego and that kind of thing in these worlds now. We're getting beyond that. We're getting beyond that kind of thing. It's a completely solar. There's no lunar... There's no lunar Buddhic body, there's no lunar causal body. They don't exist in the lunar state. Justice is beyond good and evil, or what we would interpret as good and evil. Justice is beyond that. It's hard to, it's hard to imagine. But sometimes we can think something's good or something's wrong, but in fact, justice is, is, is more like truth. It's, a, it's above our own uh, interpretations kind of thing. Justice is the supreme piety and the supreme impiety of the law. We start getting into this kind of terminology that's a little bit abstract. So it's like the, the supreme piousness and religiousness and the supreme opposite of that also. It's, it's beyond good and evil. And that, that's why I, I imagine things like bad stuff happens to good people, this kind of stuff, because it's justice, it's karma. It's their karma bringing them back to balance with, with their nature, what they need to be, where they need to be at. They've gone too far on one side, now they're being brought into equilibrium which may seem rough, may seem like harsh, but in reality it's not. It's just the law of justice bringing them into balance. Everything has to have balance. When you reach the light, you will know what love is. And when you know what love is, you will know how to love and will comprehend that conscious love is the law. So conscious love is the idea of this conscious love is the law, which is different than the love we feel. Because although we th maybe we have you know, a good idea of love, but generally it's tainted with what we're getting out of the situation. You love your partner because you know, she loves you and that kind of thing, but if she didn't love you, maybe you wouldn't love her so much. Or if she loved someone else, you probably wouldn't love her anymore. You know? So it's not, it's not exactly unconditional love, right? So this is above that kind of thing. And in the Buddhic world, we find the severity of the law, but we also find the nobleness of the lion. And in a lot of allegory, in a lot of systems, the lion is always a symbol of the law. In Christianity, particularly, like in the Gnostic Gospels, uh, I believe Christ says something to the effect that it is better that you eat the law and the law become part. Of, oh, sorry, it's better that you eat the lion and the lion become part of you and assimilate with you than you be eaten by the lion. And when people say, "Ah, oh, so these guys are down with eating lions," they're talking about it's better that you consume or, or or take the law in and have that become part of you and live by the law as opposed to being eaten by the law without knowing it. Kind of that's the idea there. Also, like Daniel and the lions, then the idea that the lions didn't attack him is because he was in tune with the law. He knew the law and he was abiding by it, basically. That, that kind of allegory. Because the lion of the law is completely solar, all, also. It only, can, it only seems harsh, the same reason with, with justice. So, the, the masters of karma are judges of consciousness. 
To evade justice is impossible because the police of karma are within us. And this is this is the slide I was thinking about particularly with that question you're asking. So the chief of the archons of the law is Anubis, who who exercises the law with his 42 judges. You've probably seen this picture a million times because they showed a lot. But this is the, the weighing of the heart. We have Anubis, the heart, the feather of Matt, and then over here we have Thoth with a with a pen and paper. I don't know what he's doing. He's uh, each one of us has a book where our faults are registered on the day and hour that they are committed. So this, this, this God Thoth represents this principle uh, that's all being recorded. Also that the term Sephira as, as, has that connotation, like those, those um, what we call spheres also record because they're related to speech and, and letters and numbers and mathematical, mathematical principles and in Cabal they're also referred to as the Akashic Records, which is the records that records everything. There's a, there's a great video out there, you might, maybe I'll send you guys a link to it. It's called The Seal of Truth, and it, it's an Israeli man who wasn't overly religious, but he had other body experience, and he went through all this stuff that talks about this kind of thing, but from the Hebraic side of it, so, I mean, the Lord Anubis, you know, is the god of karma, but it doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to look like this, but then in Egypt, Egyptian mythology, this is how they represent him. Can be re represented differently in different mythologies, but it's the principle that it represents that matters. What was it called? It's called the Seal of Truth. It's all in Hebrew, but it, but it's uh, you know they got the English subtitles. He's talking about his experience of, of you know dying, going to this. They don't use terms like karma or anything because they, they use the Hebraic terms. But the idea is of going before the judges and that they read a book that had all his faults in it and all this kind of stuff. It also keeps track of all the good things you've done too. I've been researching kind of outer body experiences lately just because it's an interesting subject related to astral bodies. There was another video that Ed watched and he told me about and uh, said the guy had the outer body experience, near-death experience, and uh, a higher being asked him, what have you done that was good in, in with your life? He said, I became, I don't know what the term is, major general in the U U.S. Marines or something like that. And he said, well, this is something you did to glorify yourself, but what, what good have you done? And then it showed him flashing you know, yelling at his wife, and then in turn, she, uh, the kid was watching, and it shows the kid at school throwing his crayons at another kid, and the wife at the mechanics yelling at the mechanic, and that every action that you do like this, like, you're responsible for, because you create this wave. Mm -hmm. So the good waves are, are what we have to, you know, be conscious of trying to put out there. That's the good vibes, the good energies, because everything you do has an effect. You know, if I stood here and yelled at everybody, you think like, that guy's a jerk, but then you go home and maybe maybe you resonate like he yelled at me, I'm yelling at you kind of thing, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that that's that's something that's been unleashed into the physical world. It seems abstract, but it is more of a concrete reality. Now this this force is being expressed through us and we're passing it on. And that's the idea, and it gets into the more so karma is not a mechanical law, it can be forgiven once you start knowing these laws. To cancel karma is possible with good deeds. Uh I don't know particularly why I picked the picture of St. Martin giving half his cloak to a beggar. Uh, it's just what I found. It seems like a good deed to do. So. Um, we must constantly perform good deeds in order for us to have capital for the payment of our debts, of our debts of this life and past life. So we have to be doing good deeds, right? And that's what this is showing. You know, Anubis, again, the amphora of the heart, the feather of Matt. But it gets a little bit deeper. To perform a good deed is not what counts but to know how to perform it, right? Um, karma is forgiven when we become totally inoffensive, when we are not capable of performing evil against anyone. So a lot of stuff we think we're doing for, to be, you know, we put good out there, we're trying to do good deeds, they can be tainted and tainted with the ego also. Like say the idea of I'm gonna donate to a charity and then they'll put my name on a big plaque with big shiny lights around and everybody walks by and sees how great I am. This idea, you know? Yeah. So that's gonna be more of an, Ego, so, yeah. You have to look at the motive. You have to look at the motive, exactly. So, so karma, they forgive the karma when you're not capable of performing the evil against anyone or performing that action again. That's the same idea of repentance and stuff. You know, you can be like, uh, Divine Mother, sorry for doing this. I'll never do it again. Please help me not do it again. Uh, I'll never do it again. And then you go and do it again. You didn't repent. You're not sorry. The true repentance is in every second, not doing the thing that you're re repenting for. So the idea, and like in Roman Catholicism particularly, that if, yeah, you know, if you fought with your 
fought with your brother and punched him in the nose and all that stuff, then you said three Hail Marys and it's forgiven, then you go do it again. So that's <laughs> enough for you. And then you do more Hail Marys and it's forgiven again. Right? That's, that's the idea. That, that, that's not how that works. The law of karma, that karma will be forgiven if you consciously never do that again. You're always conscious of that. I imagine there'll become a point where you don't have to be consciously thinking about not doing that because you'll get to a higher state. So Gabura is the divine soul, right? We saw that previously to Gabura was Tiferet, that was called the human soul. This is called the divine soul, which is a good term to use. And some other terms I use animal and human soul, but that's too confusing. This is the, the human soul and then the divine soul. The divine soul is feminine. The divine soul, yeah, there we go. We have a lot of feminine and masculine principles inside of us. <laughs> the divine, so the divine soul and the human soul are the twin souls within us. Even when we don't have them incarnated, they're still there. We still, basically, the idea is those, our souls exist somewhere. We're just, we're just detached from them. So as we're going around the wheel of samsara, the soul is above and beyond that. But they're these two twin souls. They're called the twin souls. I have a question. Yes. Are they, like, exploring the plane? Yeah, it could be a new terminology for it. The twin flames and the idea that our souls of a twin nature. I could, I could cross that bridge. Sure, I don't know the, I don't know the terminology particularly. I don't know what school is. The idea that there are twin souls, and th this comes across in a lot of these kind of epics of knights saving the, saving the damsel in distress. The knight being the human soul, the damsel in distress is the divine soul, right? The wedding of Guinevere to the knight is a marvelous event within which we experience a radical transformation. And the, the um, what do you call that? Um, the, Arthurian, the Arthurian legend talks about this in detail. This is what the main concept was. And then in that legend you see this uh, triangle of love between Lancelot, Guinevere, and King Arthur. But really it's expressing these different principles. Like King Arthur is our highest father, right? And then these two getting together, Guinevere and Lancelot is the twin souls getting together and this kind of thing. So it's not really... It has some esoteric meanings for sure. Um, the Eternal Lady, the Divine Soul, always demands from her knight all types of sacrifices and acts of courage. So once you even incarnate your human soul, there's more, greater, harder works to still accomplish. But I know you can do it to get that Divine Soul incarnated. So Gabura Severity is the fifth Sephirah on the Tree of Life. It's the Buddhic body, the Buddhic world, the dimension is six. It's the severity of the law we saw with karma. Uh, Gabura is the divine soul. The Buddhic body is the vehicle for the divine soul. The wedding of the divine soul to the human soul causes this transformation within us. Fortunate will be the night when after the hard battle we'll celebrate his betrothal with Guinevere. The idea. So this is the idea of all of how this is represented allegorically in different systems. But uh, it makes a lot of sense. And a lot of times you see the knight slaying a dragon to save the, the princess. And it's, you know, the human soul, the sexual forces, the divine soul, and how that comes together. And the alchemical process has also been attributed to these two also, but on a higher spiritual level kind of thing. It becomes slightly different. So Hased is mercy. This is the atmic body in the atmic world. I don't know exactly why um, it's called Buddhic or Atmic. Atmic is from the Hindu Atman. It's because in, hin in the Hinduism, I feel like sometimes there's so many cultures, we're using so many words for the same principle, I don't want to confuse anybody. But in Hinduism, Atman is that principle, this highest principle that doesn't reincarnate and suffer. It's this highest principle that you're trying to incarnate within yourself. Um, yes, yeah, the Atmic body and the Atmic world. This is the sixth, it's also in the sixth dimension, still the, the, the dimension of law and particularly mathematics. The atomic world is the world of mathematics. In the atomic world, we perceive the exact quantity of atoms that in their conjunction constitute the totality of any given object. So it's kind of like we perceive mathematical truths. So when you're looking at something, like if we look at a table, we see it through many viewpoints, above, below, within, and without. So it becomes totally different. I mean, we're outside of our senses of the physical body to start with, so it's different but we can perceive every aspect of an object. 
within a kitchen, one can see how many atoms cutlery is made of, how many molecules are within the bread or meat, etc., and that kind of thing. You can sort of see this a little bit in the astral. If you ever have an astral projection, you're trying to figure out if you're in the physical or the astral, and you just kind of touch the wall, you can start to feel, I don't know, your, your molecules vibrating and the wall's molecules vibrating and then pushing them aside. And you can like go through walls in the astral, but it's sort of the same idea with these different, but I guess in this, I guess in this world you'd perceive those actual molecules. I can't speak from experience or anything on <laughs> these higher worlds at all. I can relay some information, because it's important to remember that the most important thing we're learning right now is the elimination of the ego, right? The, 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 the three factors are always the most important, no matter what lesson we're doing. Do you guys always remember the three factors? What they Birth, are? Birth, death, and sacrifice. Birth, death, and sacrifice. It's always the most important teaching we're doing. This is a good roadmap, so we have an idea. But, I mean, you know, even like learning about this body and world at this point is like, oh, I've got so much to do. No, we don't have so much to do. We have to gain consciousness in the astral plane. That's all we have to do. We'll worry about the next thing next. You know what I mean? We're climbing the ladder. This is just so we know sort of where we're going. Have an idea. So in the atomic world, one has the feeling of a complete human being. You feel like you're a complete, complete human being. Um, in the physical world, the intellectual animal is not a human being. The one that thinks is the mind, and the human mind, in its actual state of evolution, is the animal that we carry within. The most subtle and dangerous demons abide in the mental plane, as we talked about, and that's the dangers of the mind. When we get to the atomic world, we become above all that, and that's why we feel complete. Uh, the human being that identifies with the mind falls into the abyss, and then goes through the abyss and the infernos into what they call the second death. You guys have talked about this? The inferno region? Okay, I'm not sure. I didn't add that on this lecture. I thought you guys had talked about that. In those inferno regions, it'll seem like sort of like hell, right? But it's only because you're unconscious of, of how this system works, so you're being brought to purification, but it seems like it's against your will because you're so identified with the ego. So once if you're so identified with fulfilling your ego of, of loving chips and you love the way they taste, now you don't have a physical body. You can't experience that and it feels like you're being tortured or punished. In reality, you're being stripped away until you reach a certain amount of perfection, although not of your own free will. So it is, it is a, a process that is for the good. So Hased is the innermost. Atman to the Hindus, as I said previously, and is the true human being. The true human being is, is this level of chesed, the innermost. The innermost is God within the human being. He who ignores this is only a shadow of the innermost, right? Like a spark of the innermost, wrapped in ego, uh, so far away from it, because we haven't got the human soul, we haven't got the divine soul. Once, once you have the divine soul and the human soul, the marriage of those two creates the body, with the right or the high vibratory frequency needed to incarnate this, this innermost, sometimes called the intimus or the atman. When the intellectual animal awakens from his dream of ignorance, then he delivers himself to his innermost. So once we shed the ego in, in the mental plane and in the causal plane, incarnate those two bodies, the two halves of the soul, the two halves of the soul, the, the idea of them connecting is expressly for the purpose of incarnating this principle of ourselves, this higher being, this, this innermost. It is the innermost who has to be in struggle to the death against darkness. He is always in battle. So they talk about the, your innermost is a part of you right now. We're separated from it, so we don't we feel very detached from it. But the innermost and your, your atman is working for you, is going through tests and trials and stuff, trying to give you the push to continue your work. The innermost has his work, and then at some point, when you reach the right consciousness, it becomes the same work, kind of thing. Okay. The innermost must whip the mind with the terrible whip of the willpower. The innermost is the, is the higher willpower. Those that say everything is mind commit a grave error, because mind is only one of the bodies of the innermost. We should remember that. It's good to keep driving this point home. I know it might seem repetitive, but especially in, in these modern times and everything, everything's so connected with the mind. And we identify ourselves with the mind more than anything, almost more than our physical bodies. I think, therefore, I am. Well, I don't know. There's some higher bodies than the thinking body, right? Truth is beyond thinking. So the innermost commands the mind. Do not say that your eyes are your eyes because I see through them. Do not say that your ears are your ears because I hear through them. Do not say that your mouth is your mouth because I utter through it. Your eyes are my eyes. 
your ears are my ears, and your mouth is my mouth. So basically, we're like, we're the vehicle for, for this principle right here. Although we feel ourselves independent, we think that we have, we're not connected to this at all. Through us is what this principle can express itself. And like, truthfully, our existence is to bring about uh, our innermost and hit what he has to bring to the physical plane, basically. Incarnate the physical plane, and then you'll have you'll incarnate this aspect, and then what you're supposed to bring to humanity will express itself through this physical body that you think is yours now. But in truth, it is really belongs to this higher principle, which is more of who you are than who you are right now. It just doesn't seem like that. We all carry our innermost crucified in our hearts. This is a quote from Psalm all time. Carry within us crucified in our hearts. This principle. So, I said is mercy. It's the fourth sephirah on the tree of life. It's the atmic body, the atmic world. This dimension is the sixth. It's the innermost. Uh, the essence of atman, innermost, is found within the conjunction of the divine soul and the human soul. And so, so like the human soul is, is the, like the divine soul will be a lower fraction of the innermost, and the human soul will be uh, an even lower fraction, a smaller fraction of the innermost. And an even smaller fraction of that is the essence that we carry within us. The innermost, or sometimes called the intimus, is the true human being. The innermost is God within the human being. This is just a brief recap. So when these finally get up on the internet, you don't want to read through my entire lecture. You can just go to this page see what see what's going on. Okay, and that that's the seven bodies that you talked about in the seven bodies lecture. So you have we have these two bodies, right? physical body, you have the etheric body which is connected to the physical body, then we have the astral and the mental body both in lunar states. We have to create them in solar states. And from there we have the human soul, the divine soul, and then our innermost. Those, those are the seven bodies you previously talked about. I don't think you've talked too much about the trinity yet, but we'll get into that. You may have, but I'm not exactly sure what we've talked about. Right? Oh, first we'll talk about the ah, I keep getting ahead of myself. This is a quick one. The ah is knowledge, as you know. But it's related more to tantric knowledge, right? This, this idea of this tantric knowledge. So, da'ath is tantric knowledge. Tantric knowledge is the process of mithuna, or sexual magic, that when properly utilizes, permits the intimate self-realization of the being. The development of the serpent along the dorsal spine is possible by means of the tantras. This energy is al allegorized by the devil. We must work with the devil in order to transform it into Lucifer, the maker of light. Right, the devil and the uh, and the like demonic symbolism is that tail going down, which we know as the the Kunda buffer, right? And we have to we have to you know ascend that to make it go up and transform it into Lucifer, which is the exact translation of this Lucifer is the light bringer. It's kind of the opposite of that, and that's what makes the light within us is going from the descending Kunda buffer to the rising ascending Kundalini force to enlighten the being. The statement of the intimate self-realization of the being is not possible without it. So like we said, we've talked a lot about this today. It's, it's not possible without it. But there are higher and higher levels of attainment that are possible without it. At some point, you'll need it for sure. You will for sure need it. And at that point, presumably, the masters and, and the masters of the White Lodge and your inner beings, your divine mother and your fathers and seeker, will, will send you the ways and means when you're ready kind of thing. Because we're all at we're all different levels. That's a little bit about uh, tantric knowledge. Another interesting thing is uh, I've been researching to do a paper on alchemy because it comes up in different, it's not only in this school of thought, but I've come across in different schools of thought too. But there was one in the 1800s, it was uh, a Trinitarian Christian communist commune, and they were trying to work out ways of, of preventing conception. And they were pretty religious, so they weren't, wouldn't use condoms or that kind of thing. So they started using what they call coitus reservatus, same thing. You know, coitus, intercourse, reservatus, reserving. And then they use it, use it as a means of, of uh, you know, to not get pregnant and that kind of thing. But they turned turn out they found, they started documenting they were having these crazy spiritual effects, like they're having, oh, like they're having uh, complete consciousness, they were, they were calling it, or they could feel the thoughts of other people and stuff like that. And then they started doing it further and looking into the tantra of the Hindus and seeing what they are talking about and that there is something to it. This, these documents are, are pretty interesting to me in particular, not because they weren't they weren't going at it from the idea that this is going to, you know, awaken me or, or become make me an illuminated being, but those side effects did occur from from still doing the same practices. So it's interesting. It's interesting. 
And these teachings, these teachings are out there. Okay, now we're going to get to the Logos, the Divine Trinity, the higher aspects. We can see by the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Um, the Father is truth, the Son is love, and the Holy Spirit is chastity. Chastity, as we know that, is not losing, not wasting the energies, but utilizing them, right? For the continual growth of our spiritual being as opposed to our physical being. Whosoever lies sin, sins against the Father, because the Father's truth. Whosoever hates sins against the Son, which is love. And whosoever fornicates sins against the Holy Spirit, which is chastity. You're using those, using those energies for the right purposes. So from the Bible, from Matthew 12, 31, we have, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto men. So the idea of blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, so not, not maybe not in literal blaspheming, but in utilizing it for the wrong way, utilizing it in the wrong way, as in losing the energies, will not be forgiven because you can't attain these higher spiritual realms without first containing those fluids. And we can see that too, like the Hermetic tradition has the same teaching in it of Hermes. That's why the only, the only word that exists today in our modern English from that tradition is the Hermetic seal, the idea of nothing can get in or out. That's directly talking about this, this type of idea. Okay, so Bina un is understanding in English. This is the Holy Spirit, which is the third Logos. You know, first Logos, second Logos, third Logos. And that's why we can see, we can see uh, the Divine Mother is always, a lot of the time, and especially in Roman Catholicism, is pictured stepping on the serpent or standing on the moon because she's, she's related to the sexual force, which is lunar. And of course, the snake we know what that represents also with the sexual force, either the kundalini or the kundabuffa. So, this is the, the seventh dimension, which we say is above the, the seven bodies of man, the dimension of the logos. A sacred serpent is coiled within the heart of the earth in the ninth sphere. I'm trying to show first outward, out, you know, and kind of like, I guess it's more macrocosmic, but in the universal principle, there's a universal principle and there's an eternal principle too. So this universal principle is within the ninth sphere of the earth. Presumably there's different spheres within the earth. You know, spiritual principles is what I mean by spheres. The creative energy of the third logos elaborates the chemical elements of the earth with all of their multifaceted complexity of forms. So this is what creates and expands these chemical elements to turn them into all these different forms. This is the power of this Holy Spirit, which is the sexual power. The electronic solar matter is the sacred fire kundalini. Electrons come to constitute a bridge between spirit and matter. And the Holy Spirit is that sexual force within the pistils of the flowers that expresses itself through the creative organs of all living species without which the universe could not exist. And we'll see how the, the, the Holy Spirit is intimately connected with the Christ force also, but how they're, they're slightly different from each other. One leads to the other. The Holy Spirit is within us, we, it's within everything, and the Christ force will be within that, waiting for us to reveal it kind of thing. But the third Logos is chastity, Bina is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is Shiva, the Divine Spouse of Shakti, the Divine Mother. This is from the Hindu tradition, right? I'm trying to stay a little bit away from it, but they, they have, they explain it pretty well too in those traditions. It's good to know that all these traditions are explained. So Shakti thing. would be the Father? Um, well, it gets a little bit confusing here, and you can see over here too. We have uh, Bina has two principles. It has a masculine side and a feminine side, which is which is kind of a hard concept. But we're in higher spiritual realms now, so the Holy Spirit is seen as being masculine, and and the Divine Mother is the feminine aspect of it. So uh, the Holy Spirit unfolds Himself into an ineffable woman. She is the Divine Mother Kundalini. So which one is the feminine side, Shakti or Shiva? Um, Shakti. Shakti. Yeah. Unless I'm wrong. Does anybody know more about Hinduism than me? Maybe. Well, Shakti, I think, is really wrong there. So, she is the primitive chaos, the primordial substance, the raw matter of the great work. The Holy Spirit is the raw matter. We know it as, our, as you know, it, within us, it crystallizes into the sexual fluids in the sexual waters that, that we're always talking about in Gnosis. The Holy Spirit is the sexual fire of the universe. The human being is a universe in miniature. The infinitely small is an, uh, with an allegory to the infinitely great. Okay? When we enter into authentic initiation, 
we enter into an authentic, authentic initiation when we liberate the kundalini energy. Which is really what we're trying to do with a lot of awakening of uh, consciousness is to mainly start awakening this kundalini energy that's dormant at the base of the spine and get it to start raising, rising itself up the spine through transmutations and through alchemy, you know, through, through concentrating on the chakras and uh, the reservations. So the serpentine fire of the human being emanates from the serpentine fire of the earth. So this universal principle is found in the earth and we're connected to it, you know, through our, through our kundalini energy. The energy of the third logos is expressed through the sexual organs and through the creative larynx. So the idea of mantralizing as, again, you know, the word creating, that, that we create through speech and that kind of thing comes up. The sacred serpent awakens when one is working with the arcanum AZF. And like we said, every weird word means alchemy, so that also means alchemy. Arcanum AZF. The creative energy of the third logos is a living fire. The fire rises up along the medullar canal, opening centers and awakening the miraculous powers. This idea when we're doing these mantralizations and stuff, we're trying to affect certain chakras and we can utilize those powers for a time and then, you know, it'll, it'll wear off. But once you start awakening the kundalini and it rises up to those certain levels, those chakras will remain open. And that, that's the kind of idea that you get more consciousness, more enlightenment, because now you have more tools to perceive the truth of reality. <coughs> So Bina is understanding, it's in the seventh dimension, the dimension of the Logos. Uh, so third Sephira on the Tree of Life, it's the third Logos. It's the Holy Spirit, also in chastity. You can see this come up a lot too also in the Old Testament. In, in uh, Deuteronomy in particular, they have a lot of rules of what you're supposed to do and not do. And, and losing the seed, just feeling the seed is a big big one in Deuteronomy. That men are not supposed to do that, and if they do that with women, then... The man and the woman both have to remove themselves from the community for, for one night because they're unclean and they have to obey and then come back to the, to the original Israeli, uh, Israelite community. So this kind of stuff is all over the, uh, the Old Testament. Also, they always seem to find whoever it is, the patriarch, Abraham or Isaac or Jacob, they're always going to the well to find their, to find their, their, their partners. And the well you know, represents the waters of the Holy Spirit, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of great allegories in there. So it's always a shame when you get too literal with, with great works like the Bible or the Old Testament. You don't want to do that. The whole, or you can. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. The uh, Holy Spirit is the creative sexual energy. I don't want to step on anybody's free will. That's not my intention. So the Holy Spirit is our divine mother, Kundalini. Through alchemy, the Kundalini fire rises up the spine, awakening the chakras and creating the solar bodies. Right? These processes are all really related, like eliminating the ego and creating the solar bodies aren't that separate of processes. They're kind of hand in hand. But you can, you can choose to particularly work with one or the other at a particular time, but one leads the other and the other leads the other kind of thing. Well, I guess you can create, so you can create solar bodies with your ego, but then they say you, if you don't eliminate the ego, you can become... There's a fancy word from Gurdjieff that I forget what it is, a Hannes Musen. That's someone who has these higher bodies, like a, a conscious in the astral plane, but they're, they're doing it directly with the ego and, and living out the ego and, this, and that kind of thing. So they're doing it for a kind of like a negative or evil or demonic purposes. It's kind of the idea of what black magic is. Sort of. Okay, Hokma, wisdom. This is the second Logos. This is the sun. Most uh, recognizable in, in the Christ figure. During the uh, allegory of the Christian doctrine, it, it uh, shows shows it really well. So the second logos is love. Hokma is the cosmic Christ, the Christus. It is the fire that burns since the beginning of the world within all creation for us for our salvation. The cosmic Christ is not an individual. It is impersonal, universal, and beyond individuality, personality, and beyond the eye. So we got to. Have, we have this idea. A lot of time, you say Christ, you automatically picture uh, Jesus of Nazareth. And in the Gnostic uh, viewpoints, particularly, is that Jesus of Nazareth displayed openly the process of this Christ force, and that he actually incarnated his Christ himself, and his Christ was the Christ force, basically. So his whole story shows us, you know, how to incarnate the Christ, but that it's not a particular person. So you say, when they say, let Christ into your heart, and then in 
you know, institutionalized religion, they'll say, well, that means, I don't know exactly what that means to them. If you die, you say, I believe in Jesus, and that means Christ is in your heart. It seems like a little more wishy-washy. Not wishy-washy, I'm going to pick my words more carefully. But it seems like to actually incarnate the, the cosmic Christ principle into yourself is actually more literally accepting the Christ into your heart, and not just that a, a man lived 2,000 years ago, and that's the guy that I'm putting my chips on, you know? That seems like, it seems like that idea is a little bit too, I don't know. So, Christ is a latent cosmic substance within each atom. Christ is the substance of truth and life. It is the vibrating nuclear energy of the cells within all living beings. Um, it is the fire within all organic and inorganic matter. So this is as a cosmic principle, this Christ, this Christic cosmic principle. Christ is the light of the sun. The light of the sun is the light of Christ. You see what this means a little more clearly is Christ is wisdom whose physical body is the sun. So the Christ force manifests itself in the physical world through the physical sun. That's why a lot of the ancient times will have sun worship, and sun worship was the most common. And in their own ways and rights, they're not actually worshiping the physical sun because it's bringing them light. It's because they understood this Christ principle that this sun embodied what it represented, this, this actual Christ force. And many, many cultures had this principle. They didn't call it the Christ force, obviously, because that came along with the Christian era. But they would have a different name for it. The Egyptians would call it the Osiris force or Osirian force. Christ walks with his son in the same way that the human soul walks with its body of flesh and bone. Same kind of correspondence. So here's the flesh and bone. This is actually a tool for the soul, which I haven't incarnated yet, but this is a tool for the soul. The physical son is a tool for the Christ force in the same way that it, it, its presence is felt and its energy is given to the giver of life and all that flourishes through the physical sun. The light of the sun is a crystonic substance which causes the plant to be created and the seed to be sprouted. It is enclosed within the pollen of the flower, the heart of the fruit of the tree, the internal secretion glands of the animal and the human being. This force is within all that. And now it gets maybe a little confusing because I well, our, our internal secretions, that's the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is the fluids and the sexual and, and the Christ force is that sexual potency within that awaiting for us to awaken it. So we have the, we have the uh, Holy Spirit within us based on those fluids in, in the physical sense. The Christ force is there too, but it's hidden. It's not, it's not, hasn't been awoken, hasn't been freed kind of thing. The world has consciousness thanks to the second logos. Likewise, we can also awaken and have consciousness. No one reaches the Father except through the Son. You hear this a lot in, yeah. in Catholicism. Mm -hmm. that you can't get to the Father but through the Son. And in Christianity, they use that to say, well, you have to be Christian because uh, Jews won't get to the Father because they don't go through the Son. But really, we're talking about you have to incarnate the Christ principle before you can incarnate the Father, the, the Father who is in secret. In order to rise up to the Father, we must incarnate the Christ within ourselves. There's no other way to do it. The Christ principle has to be incarnated within ourselves. A human being is Christified when the Christ force is assimilated physically and spiritually. When this, when this force it takes over your being. So before, before this, we had it was our intimus or innermost. And after he's doing the work with the Holy Spirit, this force encompasses the entirety of the being. Every human being that achieves the assimilation of the Christ force is converted into a living Christ. That's why this could be seen as you know, blasphemous by some fundamentalists. The idea is that even with Jesus of Nazareth, his name wasn't Jesus Christ. Christ isn't the last name, right? It's not, it's not his name. Christ is, comes from the Hebrew Messiah, which is Messiah. They have the same, mean, the same meaning, and it gets translated the same. It means anointed one, one who is anointed. So it's... it's Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, because he incarnated this Christ force. That's what made him the Christ. Yeah. There's other sects that follow John the Baptist as, as you know, being, being, ha having the Christ force. Uh, we must finish with the personality and with the eye in order for the Christ to be born within ourselves. Because at this point, there's, there's no ego. There's no even, you can't even be I identified with yourself as a separate entity, basically. <clears throat> as we'll see here, because within the Christ, only a single being exists that expresses himself through many. So this is one conscious force. I imagine everyone who's been Christified and has, has reached this is working on the level of co collective conscience. 
because it's one conscious force that expresses itself through many. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice a bit. Must be talking too much. The solar logos is not an individual, it is an army, the verb. It's basically the verb in action, the act of creating, and uh, it, it's, it's called like the, the, you know, uh, the Lord of Hosts, this, this, like, this Hebrew word, Sabaoth, Hosts, it's always talking about this army. The army of the voice is an internal, unconditioned, and perfect multiple unity, with no hierarchical differences. So this is why you, you know you're one of the higher dimensions, because you've got stuff like multiple unity, ideas that don't make a lot of sense to us. But the idea is that this one, this one single force can express itself through different individuals, but it's the same force. We are all one within the Christ, should be the Christ force. There are no differences between one human being and another. Whosoever incarnates the Christ force, Christifies his or herself, and enters into the ranks of the army of the voice. So now you're, you're working directly under the Christ force. This is, this is definitely doing the will of the law. The cosmic Christ force can express himself through any individual who is properly prepared. The Christ force has expressed himself through many different masters. Throughout time, all different masters. It's this Christ force that they've incarnated. And this Christ force is, is uh, represented differently by different cultures. And I have some examples here like Amida. This is the Japanese god that represents this Christ force. For the Zoroastrians, they had Ahura Mazda. This is the Christ force in their culture. Krishna to the Hindus is the, is the Christ force, the same principle. Quetzalcoatl for the Aztecs is the Christ force. You can even see him with the serpent. There's some pictures of Quetzalcoatl on a cross, which is, which is interesting. Uh, Osiris of the Egyptians and Odin you know, for the Nordics. These are, all, these are all representing these Christ force. They're all talking about basically the same principles, because they're talking about principles that anybody can incarnate. So I don't like I don't they they won't use these terms exactly, but say if a Hindu person incarnated the Christ force, they'd be Krishnified or something. If an Egyptian they'd be Osirified, right? <laughs> Just because they call it by a different name doesn't make it a different principle. And then, you know, from all this, this is when we start to rationalize with our mind saying like, no, it's not not his name's not Osiris, his name's God, or his name's not Odin, his name's you know, Christ. Like, well, we're using different names. You know, we're not we're not mad at the French for calling a dog a shame. <laughs> it's still the same thing. It's, a different, it's just a problem with semantics, right? Different terminology. So Hopema's wisdom is in the seventh dimension, the dimension of the Logos. The second cipher on the tree of life, it's the, referred to as the second Logos, which is love, which is the Christ force. The Christ force is a cosmic substance within every atom of creation. We must incarnate the Christ within ourselves. Through the birth of the solar bodies and the death of the ego, we incarnate the Christ within. And we know how that, to do that. It's through transmutation, the sexual energies, and the alchemical practice. There's no higher point than this. The Ancient of Days is the root of our being. He is the Father within us. We refer to as the Father who is in secret or the Divine Father. They're always talking about this. This picture, actually, I don't know if you guys are into art, but it's by William Blake, and it's called The Ancient of Days. And he did a lot of paintings relating to this stuff. William Blake was a... A uh, famous English writer from the Romantic period. There are, there are as many fathers in heaven as there are human beings on earth because it's the root of our being. Each one of us has a, a father who's in secret. You don't have to really think of it as like a father as being a, a man. It's just, like, it's just a, a force. And we have to use the words that we have to express things that maybe go beyond our idea or understanding. We need a supreme death and a supreme resurrection in order to have the right of incarnating the Ancient of Days. We need to die within ourselves. We need the death of the ego. The resurrection is the rebirth through incarnating the Christ force. And only through the Son can you get to the Father. That's the idea of that resurrection, incarnating that Christ force. The Ancient of Days is the first emanation from the absolute abstract space. So now we're getting kind of back to the first lecture where we start talking about weird terms. Yes. Can I just ask about the Ancient of Days? Where did <clears throat> Blake get those words? Um... I'm not sure about how old that term is, but, but it, is, it is an old term. It comes up in a lot of ancient texts. They always refer to God as the Ancient of Days, or the Elder in the Nordic text. They call it the Ancient Elder, or the Elder of Days. So, and, uh, Blake, Blake was down with Gnosticism, too, if you see his art. He, he knew all the same principles, so he probably got it from that. Obviously, it predates this particular school being revealed, like the modern Gnostic school revealed through Solomon and Horus. This is from the... 18, 1700s? I'm not sure exactly the period he's in. This 
back there. This is some more of Blake's artwork. The Ancient of Days dwells in the world of Keter. In the world of Keter, we comprehend that the great law controls all that is created. There's one great law. It controls everything. Uh, from this world, we see the human multitudes as leaves hurled by the wind. Basically alluding to the idea that this great law is the wind. And human beings are just being tossed around by this law, unconscious of it. The great wind is the terrible law of the Ancient of Days. It's also referred to as the divine law, the one law. The Father, the, 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 the law of the ancient of days. The poor state of suffering humanity is preoccupied with acquiring money and more money. They do not know they are miserable leaves hurled by the wind of the great law. The idea is, and not just the idea of we're trying to get money, but just all our vain desires and all the stuff we're trying to do, we don't understand that we're being carried all, all, along by this great law. And it's the only controlling force that there is, and the more we think we control, the farther away we are from the truth. The more we think we know, sometimes it seems like the less we actually know. But uh, only by defeating death can we incarnate the Ancient of Days. This is more Blake's, so you can see he's got the man, he's got the snake rising up, and then the Ancient of Days again. When the Ancient of Days reaches the realization of the ten Sephiroth in himself, the Sephiroth shine in the world of light as precious gems, as resplendent stones within the body of the Ancient of Days. And remember, each Sephiroth is a body and spiritual principle, so it's awoken. Each one of those ten principles are awakened and enlivened within the Ancient of Days. When a human being incarnates the Sephirotic crown, the Ancient of Days will shine upon him forever and forever. The Sephirotic crown being the, the, the triad of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the crown. And also Keter, remember, if you remember in uh, English, literally means crown. So the Hebrew word Keter or Keter means crown. Well, this is the last slide. We got through it. Okay. So when the Ancient of Days has self-realized, he tra transforms himself into, and this, and this was a big one. This is why I wanted to do that first one first. He transforms himself into Adam Cadmon, the heavenly man, primordial man. If you remember this idea from, from the very first lecture. The very first lecture, we showed the descent from the spiritual to the material and gross in darkness. And now we've gone back up that exact ladder to wh where it started off with, with the primordial man, the first creation. And uh, the kingdom of Adam Kadmon is finally absorbed into the absolute, where life, free in its movement, shines. The absolute being the idea of God. So now we've gone completely back up the entire ladder. Um, okay, so that's the lecture. Is there a uh, question? We can entertain questions. Yeah. So, um, the Ainsoth, yeah. Ainsoth power, uh, yeah. where, where do they fit in? Sure, so they yeah, that could be another higher lecture parts, even in itself. Yeah, higher there, parts of the beat? There is, what? yeah. The, the, Ain, the Ainsoth has three parts. The Ain, the, the, it's the Ain, the Ainsoth, and the Ain, you can turn the lights on. If you want. Yeah. You can see it, I'll just uh, turn that off. So you can see there's this, the idea of the Ainsoth war, the Ainsoth, and the Ain. The Ainsoth war is the light of God. This is the infinity of God, and the Ainsof is total nothingness. So there's basically three stages, but you know, it gets so abstract from us from this point on that even this stage would be almost impossible for us to understand. Samuel does write about it and talk about the one, the Ain being the first seed, the Ainsof or you know, the second, and the uh, the Ainsof is the second, the Ainsof or is the third. The idea that there's a great breath and the great inhale. The, the inhale goes, everything goes back to the Ainsof. Or, except for awakened beings go back to the Ain Sof, and nothing goes back to the Ain except for the, the original primal source. But, but that stuff gets pretty abstract, but I don't even think I have a too firm of a grasp on the Ain, ain Sof, Ain Sof word. Basically, it means nothingness, infinity, and the light of infinity. This is how, how, how you know, different, three different aspects of what we consider God, basically. I know it's not the greatest answer in the world, but... The one you're getting. <laughs> but I can look into that some more, too. There is, there is a, a large chapter in the same book that I got all this information from about the Ain, the Ainsoft, and the Ainsoft War. It's a book called The uh, Initiation into K Kabbalah and, and, and the Tarot. The name of it. Sometimes it has different names. It's Kabbalah and Tarot by Samael Ambo.